Next speaker is Roxana Myers. Her topic is managing plant parasitic nematodes in floriculture and nursery production. Here you go. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, I want to say, to Hefna for inviting me to talk about my very favorite subject, nematodes. Um, although it's very difficult to follow behind John and Tracy, because what they do is what I call fancy pants research. Um, so you got your head all boggled, but now we're going like, to come back down to earth, and I'm going to tell you about my job and my attempt to kill these invisible worms that hardly ever die. So I'm going to take you through some of my struggles here. And um, there's a lot of um, promising products coming up. So I'm really excited to share those with you today. OK, so I'm going to start off by telling you um, what plant parasitic nematodes are, just in case you don't know. Um, they're microscopic, non-segmented worms, but they actually look a little bit more like snakes. <laughs> they're translucent and extremely tiny. Um, they have this stylet right here. Um, which is their mouth part that they use for piercing plant cells. And then that's what differentiates them from other types of nematodes. So they're really easy to identify if you have you know, the, right, microscopic, uh, the mi right microscopes in your lab. Um, but believe it or not, these little tiny organisms cause billions of dollars of damage. They're a problem throughout the world in most cropping systems. And you can see one of the reasons is, it's because see how they're bunched up together? That's how they are. They work together as a team. And so they're always aggregating, and they reproduce exponentially. So before you know it, once you infest your field, you're going to have a huge problem on your hands in no time. So how do nematodes damage crops? Um, they destroy and weaken the root systems interfere with the uptake of water and nutrients, um, cause stunting of plants, and poor crop yields. Um, in Anthurium, we notice mostly that they reduce the number of flowers that you get and also the size of the flowers. And this is a root system um, just beginning to become infested. You see right here, there's some small brown um, lesions, and then that's your sign of initial infestation. And then before you know it, you're going to start getting this black root rot until the whole root system is blackened. And uh, as JK at the farm said, they're just the plants that are heavily infested are just floating on top of the cinder. So they have no good anchoring system, you know, once the nematodes get a hold of them. I'm going to start off with um, nematodes in nursery production because I did say nursery in my title, even though I don't hear too much from the um, certified nurserymen, and that's because there's a good reason for that. If you are shipping your plants to the mainland, you're not supposed to have plant parasitic nematodes. So unless you have a real problem, I shouldn't be hearing from you. Because um, there's a zero tolerance for burrowing and reniform nematode, um, which are regulated quarantine pests. And so a certification is required through the Hawaii Department of Agriculture um, to ship potted plants to the mainland. And you'll see um, they have to have the stamp right here, and they will be inspected um, a couple times a year. And then they have to follow you know, all these cultural practices to make sure they stay clean. And those are propagating plant material by seeds, cuttings, or tissue culture. Um, you have to use sterile media, tools, and pots. Um, you need to grow your plants out on benches. And most importantly, you need to train your staff in good sanitation practices. What about the um, nematode? Is that only for the Hawaii to the U.S. or is it also between states that they the mainland? Um, it's for any states um, that have you know, the nematode. So like Florida has to go through the same thing because they have reniform nematode and burrowing nematode as well. So they're under the same regulations that we are. So any infested area, there's a quarantine. Um, Particular, you know, going to certain states who don't have it, like, you know, California and Arizona, for instance. And because these nematodes, these two that are on the restricted list, are so damaging, like, they, they just, they don't want it. You know, they would just cause a tremendous amount of loss to their crops um, if their area did become infested. And that's why it's like, you know, such a big deal. <laughs> what makes it difficult for our growers here, because keeping your nursery free of nematodes is no easy task. <laughs> Um, so the most important thing that's come up recently within the last uh, seven years is that now it's required for you to steam sterilize um, your cinder media. Um, because when I first started here, we did get some rejections of potted dracaena from California. And so this is the new rule that um, became, became of those rejections. So you can either, uh, if your nursery is large enough, you can purchase a small system like this and steam your media in these um, sole carts. Or you can buy already steam sterilized media. 
um, which can come to your house, still flaming on fire and <laughs> ready to go. Um, so to steam this media, you have to get the temperature up to um, 100 degrees Celsius, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit for a total of 30 minutes. But getting every part of that cinder load up to temperature um, usually takes about two and a half hours. Uh, I think it's about three hours for um, the big giant steam truck. So I'm going to talk mostly today about burrowing nematode because this is the nematode that I work with a lot because this is what the growers are always calling me about. Um, it's a migratory endoparasite, which means that it lives inside of the root of the plants. And it doesn't, there's like some nematodes like root knot nematode, which are sedentary and they just stay in one place. Um, this one is a little more difficult because it travels throughout the plant so it just keeps doing more and more damage you know just one nematode can cause a lot of damage but yet you know we see 10,000 nematodes in one plant you know no problem um, they're found in the roots and gobo of anthurium and the big thing is they're disseminated through cuttings so I know that um, a lot of growers like to use top cuttings you know it's very convenient and that's the easiest way to replant your field um, but if you're plants are contaminated, um, you're just going to start, you know, with contaminated plants in your new, you know, fresh field. So the strange thing about anthurium is that these nematodes actually do go up into the gobo stem. And so this makes it very difficult, um, you know, to get clean material. And also sometimes the gobo will be non-symptomatic. So it looks clean to you, but still these guys are so tiny, you know, just a few in there can just start a whole big problem. So one of the things you can do about that is um, you can disinfest the gobo with a hot water bath. So for um, 15 minutes at 122 degrees Fahrenheit, um, that'll disinfest the nematodes from the gobo cane. And if you're worried about bacteria blight, you need to extend that time to 24 minutes. Um, of course, using tissue cultured planting material um, is always the best, but it's difficult to obtain. Um, so if you want to um, have a nice, healthy nursery, the best thing to keep in mind is to start clean and stay clean. Um, you need to start with clean volcanic cinder for your planting beds. Um, especially watch the water movement from surrounding beds and fields. So if you're going to plant a new field, you don't want that to be downstream from an older infested field. Because when it's a really rainy day, you need to go out there and take a look where those rivers are running because nematodes are known to surf and that's the best way that they get around. So we have to watch out for that and also, um, you know, any standing water. And again, I have to say, you must train your staff in good sanitation practices because going from old infested dirty fields into new clean fields, you know, it's important to clean your tools. And I know a lot of people ask me about shoes. Um, I don't want to get all nitpicky and say, you know, you guys need to start disinfesting your shoes. But, you know, if you do have cinder on them, the nematodes can be harboring inside and they drop off in the new clean field. You know, you have started a nematode infestation and although it's going to take a while for you to see that, you know, it's a slow process, but before you know it, you're infected and you have no idea, you know, how that infection came along. So I'm starting to think maybe shoes are a little more important than I originally thought. <laughs> But today, I'm so excited to talk to you about these new nematicides. Because since I've worked here the last eight years, there have been no nematicides coming out on the market. So really excited about this. Um, these are two products uh, that's been developed by Bayer. The active ingredient is fluopyram. Um, one is indemnify, and that's approved for use on golf courses. And the other is um, Luna Sensation, which also has um, a fungicide in it, um, but a lower concentration of the fluopyram. Uh, I kind of am interested in the Luna Sensation because, like I said with the anthurium, when you see the nematodes come in, it follows up with a root rot. So if there's some way that, you know, you can kill the nematodes and any kind of, you know, secondary fungus that's coming in, you know, causing this blackening of the roots, um, that would be really beneficial to the growers. So I'm very excited. I'm finally getting to try these out. Um, right now, they're not approved for ornamentals, um, but we're working closely with the bear representative. Uh, he's watching our trials, and as soon as you know, he sees some promising results, he's going to go back to the people he needs to talk to and convince them that it's worth putting ornamentals on the label. So hopefully that will happen. Can you get an SLN label in the meantime? 
Um, I'm not sure about that. I don't really know anything about the, <laughs> the labeling part. Um, it's a special local needs uh, label. Right. Know, maybe, uh, um, the manufacturer has to uh, approve it, I mean, support it, and then um, it's up to the association to, to request. But, um, you know, it sounds like you already did it since Bear is already supporting it. Right. But, so just a matter of getting data and industry requesting. So yeah, I will talk to them about that because um, we definitely got to get this online for us. Um, we're doing some field trials right now. I mean, we're just at the very beginning, um, but it's looking promising. And so I'm really excited that we finally have, you know, some product <laughs> that has a lot of potential. Because if you remember uh, couple, last year, um, we did another trial. We tried some different fungicides and insecticides that people thought might have some kind of effect on the nematodes. And unfortunately, we didn't see, you know, anything that looked really promising. Um, so it's great to see, you know, we have some new products to test. What is it? If it's not for ornamentals, what is it labeled for? Um, golf courses. Oh. Turf. Because, I mean, it's, it's about market too, right? To, yeah. Turf's a huge market, and, you know, especially with the nematodes, it damages the appearance of the turf. <coughs> and so everybody wants, you know, their turf to look the best. <laughs> so they're willing to, you know, put money in, into, you know, applying whatever chemicals are necessary to, you know, make it look so beautiful. Um, so we have a field trial going right now, um, and we have Mature Starlight, which has been in the ground for two years and did show stunting with nematode damage. We have 52 plants per treatment and four reps, and we're doing a monthly nematode sampling from cinder and roots and a weekly harvesting and sizing of cut flowers. So I want to say this is all in collaboration um, with the University of Hawaii. Um, I've been working very closely with um, Joanne, who brought me into this project, um, Brian Bush. And they actually started using indemnify first uh, up at Waikea. They had a lot of nematode damage up there, and they just wanted to see, you know, is this going to help? And they did think that their plants looked healthier. So we took it to the next step, and thanks for bringing me in on this project because I'm super excited about it. <laughs> um, so here's, a, here's just some, like, very preliminary data that um, Brian pulled together for the rep so he could see, you know, we are getting a, some results. Um, this was the initial nematode sampling. Um, so this is the number of nematodes right here. And then the red is um, untreated, and then the right is indemnify. So at first, you know, we kind of have about the same amount. And then over time, um, we start to see, okay, we're getting a little bit less on the blue and, you know, more on the red. But nematodes are tricky. So, of course, you're going to have some like, oh, well, what happened here? You know, did our treatment, like, move over? Did the nematodes move? But it's, it's never going to be perfect result. Um, this was only after the first application, but we have done a second application. And even though the results haven't been uploaded, that has looked the most promising. I've seen a huge um, reduction in the number of nematodes um, in the treated plot. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe one application wasn't quite enough. So, you know, you have to go back, give it a second application, and then that's the one-two punch that knocked them down. So. We're going to keep on with this trial, and then next year I'll be able to let you know for sure the final results. Yeah, I was just curious, do you know the mode of action on the, the how it affects the nematode? You know, that's a good question. I should know that. <laughs> um, just, that might, just understanding that mode yeah, of action no. might help you with the application of the process. Yeah, it, it is like a longer term. It's, it's not like, a, you know, it's a contact where it's just going to paralyze it right there, like a, a lot of nematicides um, that, that are effective. Um, it does have something to do, you know, I think with binding up like the fatty acids or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm not for sure, but it definitely is something that, you know, it's going to work more over, over time and not an instant paralysis. Okay, so we have a second field trial going where we're looking at um, mature, mature Midori. Um, we're also going to test, we're testing the Luna sensation as well as the Indemnify. So I can compare the two because I really want to you know, narrow it down to what the best product is um, that's going to you know, fight this nematode. And we compare that with an untreated control. 
And we're going to do nematode sampling um, of the cinder and roots just quarterly for this experiment because it's much, much bigger. <laughs> so there's a lot of work involved with digging up roots and cinder and extracting and going to the microscope. So um, since we didn't see like instant results, you know, like you were saying, like, oh, the next month it was down, you know, we're just going to look at it over time. And most importantly, um, if it helps the plant to become healthier and vigorous, you know, the main thing isn't nematode number, but it's going to be the flowers. So we want to see some differences in the flower yield is what's really going to convince, you know, us that it's being effective. Uh, so we'll also be doing the weekly flowering and uh, sizing of the flowers. Okay, so on top of that, uh, those two are ongoing, and then I'm doing the experiment the way I like to do it, which is a little bit more under my control. Uh, so I'm going to do um, box trials. And so this is what we used before to test like the fungicides and stuff. It's like these um, small boxes, and we plant the plants right inside. Um, but the good part about it is that I know how many nematodes are going in those boxes. I, you know, we can go out into the field and you just don't know what the numbers are. And the way nematodes cluster, it's going to be variable. You know, a lot of nematodes, you know, on this plot, not too many over here. So that's why you've seen some of the numbers on the controls. Oh, how come plot number four is always so low? You know, you're messing with my data here. But that's how, you know, nematodes exist in nature. So this way, I can just put 2,000, you know, in each box. So I know how many I started with. And then when I look at my final nematode populations, you know, it makes more sense, you know, I can quantify it better and say, yes, it really is, you know, reducing the populations. Uh, so we'll be looking at um, Luna sensation and indemnify, um, as well as um, looking at Nimitz um, up here. This is another new nematicide on the market, which um, a lot of people talked very positively about at the Society of Nematologists meeting. So I definitely wanted to th throw that in um, and test that out as well. And the active ingredient in that is um, fluent sulfo. So, um, hopefully, you know, that will work also and we'll have a lot of promising new products for the growers. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears into um, more like cultural practices. So starting clean, staying clean, let's go back to that. Um, I think it's getting a little maybe more difficult to get clean cinder nowadays. So we need to start looking at ways that we can, you know, treat this cinder. Um, and I've always talked about steam sterilization because that truly is the only method that I have ever used that kills 100% of the nematodes. So if anybody asks me how to kill them, I will say steam. <laughs> because 100 degrees um, Celsius, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, kills almost everything. You know, there may be some very like highly resistant weed seeds <laughs> or viruses that might get through that. Um, but steam will definitely do the trick um, to thoroughly disinfesting your soil. And I've worked a lot, you know, with the cinder, um, the, the media cards, um, trying it that way. And then I worked with some vegetable growers who wanted to steam, you know, compost and soil mixtures um, for their organic greenhouses who had root knot nematode problems. And so we just kind of used the same idea uh, as with the soil carts, but instead you use this um, uh, rubber mat. And so this is a really, really heavy mat. Um, you lay it down there, you try to you know, weigh it down even more. And so you lay a fabric, oh, I don't have a picture of the fabric cloth, but there's a fabric cloth that you hook up to your boiler and you just lay it right on top and then put the mat on top of that. And so this fabric cloth is just full of holes, the steam comes out, but there's nowhere for it to go. So it's forced to go down. Um, and then this way you can get it down deep enough to where the roots of the plant would be and that's as far as your nematodes are going to be. They're just going to be as deep as, you know, their host plant. So that takes about the same amount of time, um, two to two and a half hours, you know, to get up to temperature. Uh, I can tell you we've been trying some things that things, you know, can go wrong. <laughs> um, one time we tried and when we were trying to you know get the mat sorted we like kinked the fabric hose and so it took about three and a half hours <laughs> before you know we could get up to temperature because the steam wasn't coming out properly and so we kept looking and it just didn't look like it was rising right you know and Kathy kept saying I think the hose is kinked and, um, so we did it did manage to steam to find its way through you know over time but it shouldn't have took that long as soon as we pulled the mat back sure enough 
you know, we had some kind of problem with our system. So working your equipment correctly is very important <laughs> to making sure that this is going to be an effective treatment. Um, another time, the boiler broke down on us before we could finish, so we only went to one and a half hours. But um, even though it didn't get up to this 212 degree Fahrenheit, all of the probes, because we put like a bunch of different, you know, thermocouple probes so we can test like a lot of areas, because there's always like some kind of cold spot and you don't know where that's going to be because each system is different or the density of the media is different. So one, only one, I think, probe didn't get up to temperature, but it got up to nematode killing temperature. So I was pretty happy with that. And when we went back and sampled again, yeah, there were no plant parasitic nematodes. So I wouldn't recommend one and a half hours. I'm still going with two, but you know, it's an effective treatment. Um, okay, now this, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about, this is all very preliminary. <laughs> But I'm really excited about this project. Um, I did some work uh, with Dr. Hara and Dr. Zhang with hot water drenching of potted plants. And so we found that that is an effective way to disinfest you know, media um, with the plants inside just using hot water. Um, so we're doing this. Um, this is JK, he works out at Waikia for um, the University of Hawaii, and he invented this little system right here, which is like his hot water cart. So this is a um, Paloma hot water heater, a generator, and your propane tank, and then that's hooked up to like a heat resistant hose. So we did some trials just going out there and having him like water the beds and you know, see what would happen. And what was great was, wow, it just the temperature got up so fast. I mean, you know, when you're doing steam and you're waiting around for hours out in the field, this was really exciting. I mean, 20 seconds, the temperature was up to nematode killing temperature already. Um, in two minutes, we're at 166 Fahrenheit. And even after we stopped drenching, you know, the temperature remained hot. The water was like still moving around in there. So even five minutes after, um, it was still at 162. And see mortality of plant parasitic nematodes, 122. So it's not that high. But there's some problems with it is you have to have contact. You need to have complete coverage of this water in your beds because the nematode, I mean, the water movement is not like with the steam movement. So you're not going to get like thorough, um, you know, diffusion of the heat. So you need to really cover every little tiny inch to make sure that water hits those nematodes or you're going to have pockets, you know, where you have survivors. And then next thing you know, a uh, while down the road, oh, your population is back up again. So um, even though the cinder has really good heat retention and it stays hot for a long time, um, if it doesn't like diffuse well, you know, within the bed, um, it's not going to be an effective system. And so, like I said here, difficult to predict the water movement. Um, and here's JK holding this hose. And let me tell you, that's not a comfortable thing to do. The hose is heavy. It's hot. He's wearing like this, you know, glove that's trying to keep some of the heat off his hand. So it didn't seem like anybody, you know, would really get behind this too much. So I have to say thank you to my research leader, Dr. Tracy Matsumoto, who came up with the best idea on the planet. And that is a walking tractor sprinkler. So <laughs> at times like this, I got to say, I just love my job. I mean, this is just too much fun going out there, playing with this thing and, <laughs> and trying to find a way that we can make it useful. Um, so Kathy um, had to you know, make some changes. She drilled some extra holes in the sprinkler. Um, but even before she drilled the holes, it looked like we were getting complete coverage. Um, the thing is, do you know why? You see how slow this thing, you can't even barely see it move it. That's how slow it moves. It's so slow, but that's what we need because it's so slow as it's going, you're getting that complete coverage, you know, that we're looking for. So it's super exciting. And then, okay, we have this one. It even can navigate cinder. And not only that, we had it climbing this thing right here. Like it climbed the sidewalk. So <laughs> it is like a little tractor that could, you know, there has a lot of potential. <laughs> um, so the uh, JK's um, hot water cart um, was disassembled and sent to Maui so HDOA could use it um, against little fire ants. So we're in the process of rebuilding um, another one. Um, we're waiting for our trailer to come in. But the next thing uh, that was up next is, you know, most of these parts right here are metal. But I don't know, there's a few plastic parts. So 
we're going to see if we can melt some plastic. <laughs> so that'll be our next, you know, project with that. Um, it is kind of a side project, but I'm just really excited about it because I think, you know, if it's something, it, that thing costs, I think, Kathy found it $10 at Walmart. So it's, it's not a huge <laughs> investment. I mean, your Paloma is going to be the most expensive thing, you know, that you have to purchase with this system. So um, I want to say thank you so much to the grower collaborators because without you guys, I mean, we wouldn't have anywhere to put our experiments. We wouldn't have any plants to experiment with. Um, so thank you to Flow Resources, Pacific Floral Exchange, and Greenpoint Nurseries. And especially um, thank you to Kathy Mello who did all of this work <laughs> and is just such an amazing, innovative person. And um, she helps me get, get through all of this and um, make these experiments work properly and efficiently. Um, and thank you to all my um, UH collaborators um, for always calling me and asking me to join in on your fun projects and letting me talk about them. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, and then I just had to end. I just love this video, so I just had to end with this again. <laughs> just love my nematodes. <laughs> Oh, thank you. So how do I tell between nematodes and phytophthora? Oh, the nematode damage and phytophthora? Yeah, that's a difficult thing. The problem with nematode damage is it's often misdiagnosed. Um, you know, people will think it's a water stress, you know, nutrient deficiency you know, any number of root rots. Um, the only way to definitively tell is that you have to, you know, take a sample and um, send it off to the diagnostic clinic and, you know, we have to extract it and then get those little critters out and look at them under the microscope. It's, it's really the, the only way to tell, unless it's like root, not nematode, which causes, you know, it ga extreme galling on the root, which is obvious to see as soon as you, you pull it out. Well, one of the best things about treatment you've talked about that it kills them both. Yeah, yeah, that's what's nice about using heat. <laughs> you know, you're, you're cleaning, you know, your field. You're getting rid of the bacteria, you're getting rid of the fungi, you're getting rid of the nematodes. You're asking about the, uh, the uh, treatment of the goal. We're doing it for 25 minutes, specifically to get rid of light yeah. and, and the uh, nematodes. And you can report that uh, we've been doing some treated with the uh, Formex and some without. And we don't see any significant difference, but they're all spotting very, very well. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask you. I, I've, been, I've been dying to know how that 24 minutes is affecting the plant. Um, because a lot of the experiments that I do, it's a fine line between killing nematodes and killing your plant. And so sometimes I'm nervous to you know, make any recommendations. Um, I don't want anybody's plants to. It's just a 15 to be safe. But right. We, wanted to get rid we didn't want to spread the blight either because they're all in the water. Mm -hmm. And so we did. For yeah, it can be a blight bath if you have any infected gobo you know, going in there. So we've oh. been 24 minutes and they've been sprouting very nicely. Oh, that's great to hear. I'm so happy to see somebody implementing you know, some of these um, cultural practices. <laughs> Uh, also, I just have to say, if anybody does hot water, though, um, you must cool down the gobo after you heat treat it. Because if you don't, it's just going to continue to cook and cook and cook. And, and I've seen some bad experiences that growers have had where they didn't cool it, and they did. They baked everything, and there was no re-sprouting like you're seeing. So that, that's <laughs> the most important thing about hot water drenching. <laughs> It's you got to chill your plants after. <laughs> but room temperature water is fine. <laughs> On the testing of the uh, beds uh, with using the hot water sprinkler, um, any results so far? Um, the, we haven't actually used our sprinkler tractor system. Um, that's, that's all new. We, you know, we haven't had the um, hot water cart you know, attached to that yet. That's our next step. Um, but we did you know, do some before and after counts with just you know, like watering it in. And even though I was kind of nervous he wasn't getting good coverage as much as I would like, you know, I'm like, slow down, you know, just, just take, take your time. Um, we, nev we didn't recover any live um, nematodes afterwards. That's awesome because it you know. seems so much more practical than steam. The steam is yeah. effective. Yeah, that's how I feel. The steaming's effective, but I can't get a lot of growers to implement that. I mean, not only is the equipment expensive, but it also, you know, when you go out there, you're like, wow, this is tedious. You know, you have to set this up. And then, you know, I, I'm always nervous about leaving the generator on and, you know, the steamer on with nobody around. And, oh, you just seen the, yeah, 
<laughs> but even at the boiler, the heat coming out of the boiler was making a black spot on the saran. <laughs> And I was like, um, I think we have to watch this because I'm scared it's going to catch on fire. <laughs> so when you work with boiler systems, it's, it can be dangerous. And, and so, you know, it's good to have people properly trained and, you know, got to kind of keep an eye on it. So if we can come up with something that's, you know, so much easier, and, you know, when someone's harvesting plants, they can go put the tractor on one row, let it go down. And then, you know, they're cutting, cutting. Oh, when it gets to the other row, it automatically stops. Um, you, you, put up a, you can put up a break, then you just move it to the next one. So it seems like something that growers would, you know, welcome adopting. Um, you know, and just, it will take time, but, you know, since one person doesn't have to be, you know, there every second, you know, holding the hose or, you know, watching it, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I hope it works. <laughs> you have a benefit from the uh, steam that it kills the seeds. Yeah. Light, nematodes, uh, bacteria, whatever you've got there. Right. And that's, that is what's nice about steam. And then, unfortunately, I can't say the same for the hot water treatment because, you know, you're not getting up to, you know, those higher temperatures. So I have to say, <laughs> in our first trials with the hot water, um, wow, yeah, the weeds were gone. You know, I said, this is great. But somehow that must have stimulated the germination of the seeds that were in there. <laughs> because after that, it was like, woof. And <laughs> I never seen so many weeds in the plot. But, you know, you, if you know that, you know, you, before you plant, you can go in there and herbicide and, you know, take care of that. So, you know, it's not a perfect system, but there's ways to, you know, like work with it and then, um, you know, make <laughs> it work out. <laughs> Roxana, when, you, when you're doing the test with uh, the Luna, Indemnify, and Dimits, uh, how, how long do you think your trials are going to take before you come up with a recommendation? Um, the thing about nematodes is it, it takes a while. You know, and I always like kind of admired Lisa's project with her blight because she could go out there, you know, inoculate and then you know if it didn't work in a very, very short time. Um, but with nematodes, I've noticed that when I'm doing trials, like if you want to look at differences in plant growth, you know, it's going to take one to two years to see like substantial differences where you can walk out there and go, wow, you know, you inoculated that, you didn't inoculate that one. Um, so that, you know, the damage takes a little bit longer, you know, over time. And, you know, because it's, it's a, nematicide and it's not like killing everything you know it's not like I can be like oh, okay you know like the steam I can tell you tomorrow it worked or it didn't work you know so um, I think next year uh, at this meeting I'll be able to you know really give you a good update we'll have three trials in the ground you know we should be seeing something for sure whether it, yes or no you know or Can hopefully <laughs> Uh, yeah, she's my partner in crime. <laughs> you may have been using some of these, these uh, nematicides prior to uh, Roxana running tests. The Luna? Yeah, some of these. Do you have any experience on some of these? Oh. Luna or indemnify? Uh, or the Luna, uh, yeah, with the, we just did a really fast um, trial of one of our plots okay. where you selections then we're really hit by the nematodes and yeah like within two months or so we notice a big difference so that's why we went to Roxanne and say let's try this so we've been putting out on different cultivars but we needed a more control so that's why we went to the so you think um China's one is going to be the real thorough yeah. formal test but the quick and dirty one, uh, do you think we can start applying for an SLN or is it premature? Probably premature. Yeah. I'm not sure you know, how much is in, yeah. involved with that and how much we, proof we really, need. Because we, we don't see any difference in the yield or production yet. Mm -hmm. We see, yeah. like in the number of roots, maybe I'm just telling somebody mm -hmm. to start off. But that's, you know, it's real yeah. subjective. Because yeah. mm -hmm. like getting an SLN might not be quick. You know? mm -hmm. and so like, we can talk to uh, Ken and mm -hmm. we can take it, uh, we can have another meeting on that. But 
anything that the industry can do to All right, we'll move it run parallel right. with your experiment, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, I think, we, um, we might want to <coughs> proceed with that. Tom, the bear. Yeah, I think Tom. Tom. Normally you work with the tech people, right? Yeah, Tom came over and he was saying if he can find one ornamental use on the mainland, then he'd be oh. much faster. Yeah. So <laughs> that would help us <laughs> move things see, along. See Larson will be there this coming tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. He'll, he'll be at our seminars. Okay, great. And we can talk to him then. So could, could maybe Kim, could you help us facilitate a meeting? Chat with maybe Joanne and Roxana. Just yeah, to get the, the few, few, the few people talk. Yeah. Yeah. So probably gonna be you and the tech guys. Okay. Person, person. Right. Okay. Oh, is he gonna be giving a talk? Uh, Steve's talking. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, then maybe he'll explain about the mode action <laughs> tomorrow's CPS meeting. <laughs> I'm so curious as to the application rate. Like, are you following what's what's a, like, the application rate for the turf? Um. Yes. We. That's what they recommended to us. We did go back to Bear and ask what they thought you know we should use, and they did say to just follow that rate. And um, if this starts to look good, like I'm really interested in like looking at different rates because I know that these products you know can be pretty expensive. <laughs> so, but, but um, on behalf of industry, cost is not the concern right now. Oh, we it's really the damn I know. I'm telling you, I get more calls from Anthony and growers. <laughs> This is my number one priority. <laughs> yeah, don't tell them, them that. <laughs> right, you want a solution. Yeah, right. And I think that's, that's the most disturbing part. You know, when the nematicide you were using gets removed from the market, you know, what are your choices? And for a long time, we haven't had a lot of choices. I've tested a lot of different potential stuff that just, you know, never really did the trick because these guys are tough. They, they don't. They don't die. Brings up the question about um, can they eventually be resistant? Like, I don't know nematodes very well in terms mm -hmm. of like, do they eventually build up resistance to particular chemistries? Um, you know, that's a good question. You know, I know it's a huge problem with insects, yeah. but I haven't really heard of that happening with nematodes. Okay. But you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> I haven't worked with a lot of nematicides either. You know. So um, this is a new area for me, you know, to, to learn about. But um. and that's why I think combining it, you know, if you have two different chemistries, it may, you know. Two right. Two yeah. Two yeah. You can rotate them. Um, mm -hmm. Have a rotation. And right. Also incorporating those cultural factors. Right. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks for you know, suggesting that. Just, just talking about different processes, I can see an integrated plan where, you, you know, using the hot water to treat, to treat your your gobo and plant mm -hmm. material. I can see the steam treating the beds, so you start out with very clean conditions. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you will get some infestation at, mm -hmm. at a latter time as the beds age, you apply a limited amount of chemicals. Right. And I think you know right. some combination like that mm -hmm. is gonna be the ultimate answer in terms yep. of how we stay in business today. Uh, Plus getting the right Cultivars that are resistant. Oh, right. <laughs> right. And tolerant is helpful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's how I envision it. We need all of these pieces, you know, to put them together. That's right. We, we need all these tools. Um, and, and host plant resistance, I didn't talk about it today, but um, that's something, you know, we're exploring too. I mean, that's a big one for me because I always thought you don't have to apply anything, you know, you just make your plant stronger or else, you know, resistant to the nematode. And that's the easiest way for the growers to adapt you know any kind of management techniques so um well, just as an example again i just had to buy some uh, steam cinder recently oh. over 30 dollars a yard oh over 30 dollars wow a yard. it sounds it's like it's been up just for a truckload of cinder <laughs> yeah otherwise you're bringing in all the yeah, nematodes yeah you don't know it's a waste, a waste of effort right right yeah if you can start clean i mean even if you know, nematodes do come in, the longer you can let the plants grow, you know, the bigger they can get, they become more tolerant. If your plants are like super healthy, um, they can have a lot of nematodes and it's not that big of a deal, you know, but um, so making healthy plants, so the bigger the plants get, the more tolerant they can be. So over time, and then of course, you're gonna change out your beds, you know, eventually. So you gotta try to keep pushing, 
pushing the nematode reproduction down, down the line. You know, so I think it's super important to start clean. Can you refresh my memory? Did you folks test out spiral tetramath? Oh, Contos. Yeah, I think that was in the one we did Clearies and Contos. And <clears throat> um, unfortunately, we didn't see a lot of significant differences in the nematode reproduction um, and yields, I don't think. And we did a few different trials, you know, in the boxes, you know, with, with those. But because we had heard a lot of promising things from the grower. So we were like, oh, you think that's working? You know, we'll, we'll try it. I mean, we'll try anything. You know, we, we need to find some solution here. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think, you know, you know, could have been part of a flaw in our experiment too, but um, we just didn't get excited enough to pursue it again. Yeah. Uh, question on the uh, hot water usage uh, with the plants. Did you have to cool it off after? Or yeah, same thing. Yeah, you have to, you know, what we did, we did Dracaena in the um, UH hot water shower. And, you know, we just um, turned off the top nozzles and just pumped it down in there. Um, had like a pot within a pot. But after that, as soon as we took them out of there, you know, we rinsed them, um, you know, at the hose for, you know, kind of a while till it was like the water was really pouring through. So, we, you know, we had to really force that heat out. Um, or, you know, you could submerge it in a cool bath, too. But I think, you know, with potted plants, it's, like, better to, like, force. you got to, like, force the water in there, you know, because there's a lot of compacted areas, you know, within the pot. That's so what we found. The tighter the plants were in the pot, then the l less, uh, you know, efficacy that we would get. So even, like, it's better if it's, like, looser and it's younger plants and the roots aren't just packed in there, you know. That all makes a difference, so. Um, and that would kill the... Uh, hot water drenches is tricky. Um, you know, I can't really say to... I have to look at my, my gradient where I have all my little organisms <laughs> on my chart. Um, yeah, I don't know what the heat temperature... It's, it's, it's probably pretty high. Yeah. So for steam, definitely, but... This, this hot water is, is um, you know, not as strong. <laughs> for some reason, this is like the nematode's Achilles heel, though. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sticking with researching this, because <laughs> we'll get them this way. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you so much.